And that's it. That's more or less how I edit my videos. <laughs>
import media. And what I do is I browse only to my footage folder. You see that? Remember, I've got footage in subfolders as well. The secret kind of trick that I love doing is I tick this box right here that says keywords from folders. You see that? Have a look at this right here. I make sure that I also tick leave files in place. That way I'm not getting duplicates of my footage and it is instead referencing the footage that I have in these folders already. I go ahead and click import select and it brings in all of my footage. Now, here's what's so awesome. Obviously, this can be a bit overwhelming, right? Look at all of this footage. You see, there's audio, there's, you know, outside stuff, B-roll, studio stuff. But if I expand this, have a look at this. It created keywords from those folders that I had already set up in that original template. This is so much faster than having to recreate everything from scratch. So here are the folders here, which get converted into these keyword collections. So for example, studio, boom, there's my studio stuff. Here's my doc tests. Here's my B-roll. And it is so much faster and better organized to be able to just jump to a keyword collection of a particular category of segment that you're wanting to edit. For this particular video I was making, I have my audio track. Remember, that was saved on an SD card, which was on my external recorder. I have cam one. That's my camera right here. <laughs> I have overhead. You know, the one I use, the X-T2 for all of my overhead shots. And I have cam screen. And I have a computer screen that I recorded at the same time because I was actually working on my laptop demo in Lightroom. So there are five separate source files of footage that all need to be brought in together into one sort of area where I can edit that. Audio, cam one, overhead, cam screen. That's the screen of my camera, right? That I have connected to that external recorder. And computer screen. I use a program called Camtasia to record my screen. So what I do first is I click on each one of these and I'm going to rename them. I click on the first one, audio. I go over here and you see where it says basic? I change that to general. And where it says camera angle, I write audio. Boom. Next, camera one. Next is overhead. I'll put in overhead. I could call that cam two, but it's just easier for me to think of it as overhead. Next is cam screen. Note that I'm writing this in camera angle and not camera name. That's very important. I'll tell you why in a second. And lastly, my computer screen. Okay, now that I have named the camera angles for all of them, I'm going to select everything, right click, new multi-cam clip and I'm gonna name this main multicam. I'm gonna tick the box that says use audio for synchronization and then angle assembly, I'm gonna choose camera angle. Make sure that it's 4K and I do 24 frames per second, rendering in Apple ProRes 422 and I click OK. And now it's synchronizing all of the different angles of footage by using the audio waveforms to match them up exactly. And once it's finished, I double click on it to open it up. And here it is, have a look at this. I've got my audio track, camera one, camera screen, computer screen, and overhead. Now, as you can see, I spent about an hour recording this clip, right? So I had camera one rolling for about an hour. However, I only used the demo on the computer screen. You know, that's the part where I say, look, you go into your menu here and da -da. I only did that for a very short amount of time, but it put it right here. You see that right where it should be. Same thing with the computer screen. That way I'm not running all of my camera angles for an hour. That's using up a lot of footage and it takes longer. So I just turn them on when I'm ready and I turn them off when I'm finished. And Final Cut Pro knows where exactly to drop it in based on the waveform matchup. I usually run my overhead the whole time though. So these are the ones that I run all the time. I'm gonna play camera one with the audio that came from camera one. This is what it sounds and looks like. Twice. Can I get my fucking lines right? <laughs> That was that was not a bit I set up for this video. I literally random dropped right there and you can see the frustration that I can go through a lot. Get my fucking lines right when I'm shooting these videos. I am so glad this happened and you're able to see it. It is not all fun games, lollipops, puppies and springtime flowers here. It's a lot of hard work. Good. I'm glad you're seeing this. But I'm gonna play it again, and I want you to hear how bad the audio sounds. Let's talk ergonomics. The 18 to 55 millimeter is fairly compact for the focal range that we're gonna fix that, and we're also gonna color correct it a bit. Now, color correction and fixing audio, 
not going to be discussed here. That's too big of a subject. But if you do want to hear about those topics in much more detail, please let me know. I've already got some predefined color correction templates. So what I do is I drag Studio Correction onto it, boom, and it corrects it just a little bit. Here's before, after, before, after, before, after. What I did basically was I spent a lot of time with color charts, getting this initially set up so that I had it exactly to the same lighting that I have, and then I saved it as a preset. So I just drag and drop that preset on here. And as long as I'm using the same lighting, the background and everything else, it will match up. And that's all I have to do, drag and drop, done. That investment of my time, which took me about half a day to do, has paid off 10,000 fold in future videos of being able to drag and drop a preset. And I also have one for the Fuji cam screen as well. I make it a little bit brighter, boom. And then on my computer screen, I just sharpen it up. And lastly, on my overhead, I've already pre-color corrected. I have one called Studio Overhead. Drag it, drop it. Okay, I've now color corrected everything. Now what I do is I go back and I'm gonna go to my timeline. But what I do is I go to my footage, I click on Multicam and I drag it and drop it onto my timeline. There it is. The very next thing I'm gonna do, it, hold on a second. Just what I need more coffee. The very next thing I'm going to do is drag an audio preset that I made and drop it onto the clip. Now listen to it. 18 to 55 millimeter zoom and I'm going to do before and after. I want you to watch and listen, okay? Remember that I set these up in advance and basically they include a de a compressor, a channel EQ, and a limiter. Again, topics for future videos if you want. The 18 to 55 millimeter zoom and the 16 to 55 millimeter zoom lenses, both from Fujifilm, to see which one is better for shooting video. So you can tell that those audio corrections are significant and I will argue that they're even more important, not just a little bit, but far more important than the video color correction, you know, presets that I talked about. A lot of people would be forgiving if my skin tone was a little bit off or if the colors, you know, the exposure was a little bit on the dark side or a little bit overexposed, they'd be okay with that. But man, let me tell you, if that audio doesn't sound good, if it's clipped or if it's not compressed properly, people will notice and they won't like the video. Okay, so I'm about to start editing, so I just make this one change where I can see it a little bit better. 99% of the time when I'm editing my rough cut, I'm only looking at the audio waveforms. I don't care about much else until I get into the later stages of editing. And what I do is I'm basically shuttling through it, right? Playing Today a little bit. We're gonna take a Today we're gonna to take a and I'm looking for the last take that I made, right? Today we're today we're gonna to take a close Today we're gonna to take a today we're gonna take Look how many times I did this one segment. Today we're gonna to take Today we're gonna to take Today we're gonna to take It takes a long time to get it to look right. So I look at the audio waves and I'm saying to myself, screw up, screw up, screw up, screw up. What about over here? I'll jump to here. Today we're gonna to take a what about here? We will be... Okay, so I got it right on this last take. And what I do is I have set these bracket keys up, right? To trim to the left or to the right. So what I will do is hit the left bracket key. Watch this. Watch the timeline when I do this. Boom. It immediately got rid of everything before that. I don't care about anything before that. Then I go to the end of it like that. I hit the B key and go to the next little segment. We will be looking at autofocus. Depth of feet. We will be looking at... We will be looking at all. Hi everyone, welcome to Pal the Tech. We'll look at all for shooting video. We'll look at autofocus. Hi everyone, and welcome. Everyone, well. Hi everyone. Now before I go, a few other things as well. Hi everyone, and welcome to Pal. Hi everyone, welcome to Pal the Tech. Hi everyone, welcome to Pal the Tech. Today we're talking about... Now a lot of times I'll want to zoom in, right? I have a fast way of doing that. I go back to my multicam by double clicking anywhere on the clip and I'm going to add another angle. I'm going to click on my cam one, hold down the option key, boom, name this CU for close up and I'm going to transform and zoom in a little bit on it as a close up. Now when I go back... Hi everyone, welcome to Pal the Tech. Today we're talking... There's this gap right here, you see that? So I'll blade there, trim there, right? The tech. Today we're talking. Here it is without the tech. Today we're talking about. And then I click on this, right click, active video angle, 
Close up. Now watch. The tech. Today we're talking about. You see that? Isn't that great? Welcome to Pal the Tech. Today we're talking about which is the best Fujifilm brand zoom lens for shooting video. Trim the fat a little bit. Video. Is it the 18 to 50 video? Is it the. Now that's kind of a weird jerky cut, so I'll go to my B roll and grab something from my B roll. Maybe in point, out point, hit Q to put it on the top. Zoom lens for shooting video. Is it the 18 to 55 millimeter or the more expensive? And what I do is I generally add the B-roll and do the transitions and fix the audio fades and do everything as I'm going along. I don't do a rough cut and then go back and refine it. I know that flies in the face of most video editing, but I know so well exactly in my head what I want to do and these segments are so short and my timeline is so short to get this finished that for me that is the fastest way to do it. So I'm literally adding B-roll, fixing audio. The only exception to this is I will most likely add graphics later on because I can do that faster if I batch process that but b-roll and cutting and zooming in and having those different angles I do while I'm editing the very first pass now I mentioned angles right so what I do is I'll go to view show in viewer angles have a look at this these are the angles that I shot and as I skim over my footage some of them will appear like look cam screen appears right when I'm talking about it just my aperture all the So if I was editing this, I could just click on cam screen and that will jump and cut right to that. I can adjust my aperture all the way wide open to 2.8. And then here, obviously, I want to go back to myself. So I'll go ahead and click on cam one. Boom. That right there. And I'm going to have to make up for that extra light either. And then what I do to make a smooth transition is I'll drag these little audio things so it's not such jarring. There, and I'm going to have to kind of, and I'm always looking at the waveforms. See that right there? And I'm gonna have to make up for that. And I just do that all the way through the timeline. I'm cutting to the different angles, right? I'm fixing the audio as it's going through. I'm tightening up the gaps in my talking. I'm picking the best take that I'm using, which is usually the last take and so forth. And it's just a matter of going through all of this footage. Then I will go through it again and then I will continue to go through it until I'm happy with it or until I run out of time <laughs> and I have to publish it. And in that case, it falls into the category of done over perfect. And then once I get to the end, video helpful or at least entertaining. And if you did, be sure to give it the like. I grab my little graphic, hit Q to drop it above the timeline. Give it the like and subscribe. Move it to just where I like it. Be sure to give it the like and subscribe. Make it a little bit smaller. Boom. Give it the like and subscribe. And then I go to the end. Take care. And I will animate out the fade. So it eases out. Mm, take care. And then of course I wanna put the little tag at the very end. The end screen, I hit E to drop it at the very end. In a new video very soon. Take care. This is what my timeline looks like when I'm done editing. Then I go back and I add my graphics. And that can take a while depending upon the type of video that I'm doing. And I've got a bunch of graphics and plugins that I use that I drag and drop. But even with that, there is a lot of additional editing that has to go into play here. It's not really just drag, drop, and finish. <laughs> There's a lot of tweaking that comes into play. I have my own kind of right here that I use all the time in a special pal to tech. You see the underscore to put it at the top. If I want a quick bullet, Right, there it is. If I wanna zoom in, I can do that quickly. Draw a circle around something, add an arrow. So like my graphics, this, and then I add, this, and then I'll add a sound effect for my graphics. So it's all here. Lighter, that this is the clear winner for me here. And then of course, in my beginning, I've gotta put in my intro. I drop that in. Once I have the graphics ready and basically all the cuts are made and it's a final cut version, I then add my music. And most of the time when I'm using music, it's just really low in the background. You can barely hear it, but it's there. I don't honestly care who makes the music. As long as it's a reasonably good sounding beat, I just drop it in there. I don't know the name of it. I don't know the artist and I don't care to be perfectly honest with you. I just need something that has, sounds like music that's in the background. Now, when I'm using music to cut to, like for my intros or things like that, music then elevates itself to a huge part of my editing process. One that I can't get into right now, but I spend a huge amount of time researching, 
finding the right song, testing it out, making sure that the copyrights don't get zinged by the YouTube police, all of that. And once I have my music, I import it into my music event right here. And then I simply drag and drop it right below my clips. You see that? And I can adjust the audio. So example right here. Today, we're gonna to take a closer look at the 18 to 55. That would be too loud. millimeter zoom lens from Fujifilm to see so the, which one well, is better. You wanna hear it, but not video. too much. And then when I have my opening, I've got the music louder and I bring it down a little bit, watch. Hi everyone, welcome to Pal the Tech. Today we're talking and then about it comes which down. is the- And then at the end, I always bring the music back up and try and end on a beat. This part actually takes longer than any of the other music editing. Take care. You see that? I grab the camera right at that beat in the song. I don't know if anybody notices these things, but I'm just telling you that's what I do. I'll show it to you again. Boom. Take care. And that's the part at the end where I have the, you know, next video you can click on that YouTube allows us to do. That's what that little end screen is for. Now, sometimes I will screw something up royally. For example, I will be holding the camera and a lens and I will say something like, the minimum focus distance is 15 millimeters. And I won't catch that until I'm in the editor. And so what I need to do is I need to go back into the studio and re-record it using the same mic and the same conditions that I shot it in. So what I do is I come down here for another time and I will quickly, and hope the fans are off so I don't have to turn everything off, I will grab an SD card, I will put it in the Zoom F6 right here, and then basically I will hit record on that. And as you can see, the meters are showing because as I'm speaking into this mic, test, test, check, check, it's immediately recording right to the SD card. And so what I will do is I will then say the correct phrase that I should have said when I shot the video initially. And I'll do it usually twice, so I get two takes of it. With a minimum focus distance of 30 centimeters. With a minimum focus distance of 30 centimeters. Okay, I'm done. I then hit stop on the machine. Take the SD card put it in the computer here, and then I drag and drop the WAV file from the SD card onto a special folder that I have in Dropbox that immediately shows up on my editing station in my office. And it's great because I can be at my editing workstation in my office. By the time I walk from this studio into my office, that sound file is there ready to go and I can drag it right into Final Cut Pro. What I'll do is I'll drag it and drop it right below and then I simply copy the same exact adjustments I made to my regular audio and I paste them on to this ADR and then it's seamless. You can't tell. And I would say that I do this probably one or two times, maybe even five times a month. I'm always forgetting stuff. I, I you know, so I, having that workflow of being able to just come in here, turn on the mic, boom, do it, drop it into Dropbox. And then by the time I walk to my workstation, it's ready to go. That saves so much time. And I also do other voiceovers. For example, I might grab some quick B-roll of something. This microphone and this setup sounds terrible compared to this boom mic. So I will write down what I say, come in here, grab a phone, read it off of here, record that, and then drop it behind the background. Now, once I'm all done and I'm ready to export, I click on this right here, and I've got some presets for that as well. I've got a 1080 version that I use for coffee time, but for all of my YouTube videos, I use YouTube. YouTube 4K, I call it revised. It's a better version than this one. I was too lazy to take this one out, so I just choose this one, boom. And up comes this thing with these dumb tags that Final Cut Pro insists on using. Such an annoyance, you gotta do this. But anyway, I'm ready to go, there's the video. I scrub through it, make sure that it's there, and I click next, and I save it to a spot. And once I'm done, I save it to my desktop on my computer, and then I upload it and publish it to YouTube, which is a whole other video of things that I do there. But that's the process. And one of the things I just love about Final Cut Pro is that the magnetic timeline gets the hell out of my way and lets me edit. I'm not even thinking about the software. And that's a great place for me to be in. I hate using software that I have to think about the software. I don't care about software. I don't like software, to be honest with you. It should be like a microwave oven. I don't care how it's working. I don't care who made it. I don't care what's inside of it. I don't care how it operates. All I care about is how to take the coffee, 
put it in and reheat it. As long as it does its job and does it quickly, I'm a happy camper. And that's it. That's more or less how I edit my videos. Well, thank you so much for watching and I really hope you found the video helpful or at least entertaining. And if you did, be sure to give it, you see, I'm gonna add this in Final Cut Pro. Be sure to give it the be sure to give it the like and subscribe. And I will see you again in a new video very soon. Take care.